Welcome to another edition of RCE. I am your host, Brock Palin, and I have with me again Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and OpenMPI. Hey, Brock, good afternoon. Uh, this one's, this one's going to be a good one. It's kind of near and dear to my heart because uh, in my role as a, you know, a parallel systems developer guy, I've got about 50-plus uh, nodes at, at Cisco that I use for development and testing. And uh, I am I am low enough on the peon scale that I don't get any technicians or sysadmins to to help me out and keep these things running. So I have to do it all myself. And so any tools that can help me do this are are very greatly appreciated. And I want to hear about them. Yeah. So the uh, tool is uh, BCFG2, um, and we have with us two people who work on that. We have um, Naran Desai and Corey. Leaning Hainer, um, and I think they're both from Argonne National Laboratory outside Chicago. So, guys, welcome to the show. Hi, hello. So, go ahead and introduce yourself. Say your name and say a little bit about you know how you got started. Uh, I'm Narayan Desai. I uh, I work at the uh, Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory, and I'm a uh, uh, sort of a half step between a system administrator and a system software developer. So, I. Uh, uh, work on system management software and things of, of that sort. Um, basically, when I started working on Bconfig, I was a system administrator responsible for a variety of HPC systems around MCS, and we needed something to help us cope with the configuration uh, complexity and scale that we were seeing at that point. This was uh, in 2002. And I'm uh, Corey Leaning Hainer. I'm one of the system administrators on working with the uh, the leadership computing facility here at Argonne, working on our big 40-rack blue gene system and the uh, uh, visualization cluster that goes with it and all the file servers and login servers and all the, the extra support pieces that go into keeping a large HPC resource alive. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit of intro, um, maybe a little bit about where BCFG came from. Um, so uh, we call it Bconfig. Uh, Basically, uh, when I started out here at the lab, I was a system administrator responsible for a bunch of the large-scale HPC systems here. Uh, we had, at the time, a relatively large cluster. It was about 320 nodes uh, called Chiba City and uh, a small administrative staff. And uh, basically configuration problems, right? So we were supporting a group of computer scientists that were doing development on uh, a variety of uh, sorts of system software, uh, HPC system software, and numerical libraries and things of that sort. And these researchers needed access to a wide array of types of machines and large machines and things of that sort. And so we needed tools to be able to effectively manage uh, both uh, heterogeneity in our environment and uh, configuration complexity that you would see from requirements from a lot of different sorts of users. So these so days I've moved sort of a little bit more towards uh, system software development. And so uh, basically the transition has been from a system administrator to halfway between system administration and software development, which I think is actually a really interesting place to be. Cool. So so uh, actually I'm glad to hear you call it Bconfig because to me BCFG2 just – doesn't really roll off the tongue very easily. And when I was Googling around for uh, information, you know, preparing for this interview here, I, I found all kinds of things about natural gas sizes. Yeah, so uh, I started working on Bconfig in about uh, 2002, and uh, picking Googleable names was not at that point uh, uh, an important thing to consider when naming software. And so uh, I realized about a year later when I actually did a public release and, and started uh, uh, seeing – you know, actual external visibility for Bconfig that when you search for it, you got a billion cubic feet of gas. And it wasn't a term that I was previously familiar with. Uh, it's a very <laughs> Let's hope that your software doesn't produce a billion cubic feet of gas. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, uh, the thing that's really kind of funny at this point, people always sort of grumble about the name because it doesn't actually uh, communicate much about what Bconfig is other than it has something to do with configuration. And, gotcha. uh, where, where does the two come from? Because on the on the logo on your website, is that a squared or is that a two? Uh, it's it's a two. Uh, there was a bconfig one, and it was a, a miserable failure. Uh, and basically, it got to the point that it was deployed on a bunch of systems here at the lab, but it wasn't very flexible. And when you actually tried to extend it from uh, a single 
sort of small group of administrators to a larger group with a more complicated environment, it really didn't work very well um, flexibility-wise. And so we scrapped it and went and redesigned the way that it worked. We kept a bunch of things about the overall operational model, but but made it uh, more flexible and, and replaced it with a, an implementation that scaled better. So this is actually version two of bconfig. We're actually okay, getting so close to version one of version two. Clearly, I don't have this story very clear. <laughs> Clearly. So what does the B in bconfig stand for? Well, originally, uh, the idea was built around this notion of validation. So uh, the basic idea was that you want to have something equivalent to diff and patch for configuration, right? So you have a machine, you've got two machines, and one of them is different from the other, and you want to be able to say, how are these machines different? Or given this difference between machine A and machine B, let's apply it to machine B, right? So intuitively, that's a pretty simple idea. And the, once I started digging into this sort of conceptual model, the thing that I realized is that we needed some sort of validation mechanism to build a configuration from a machine. And so uh, as you start looking at the way that software gets layered onto machines, uh, you frequently have uh, an artifact on the machine where you take something like an RPM and then you reconfigure it with some configuration files and you associate that with a service that you've turned on. And all of those things are very interdependent. And so we call those bundles in bconfig. And so the B originally stood for bundle. And so it's bundle configuration tool. Um, it's not a particularly meaningful aspect of bconfig at this point. But the name has kind of rolled forward with us. Plus, it gives us that billion cubic feet of gas Google hit. Yeah, there you go. I, I guess if you actually want that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so does bconfig get involved anywhere with installing? Or do you, when installing, say, like some bare metal... Do you still rely on like Kickstart or Auto Yes or something like that, and then you just call bconfig? Like, is bconfig something you automate or not? I mean, where does it get used? So it's it's very useful at that point if you're starting out, say, building a cluster and you have all the bare metal sitting around there. If you've predefined what uh, classes of machines you want, then it does drop in after the Kickstart or whatever building phase you have. So whatever. Whatever distribution you're using, the uh, method it uses to build machines, you build just a base machine for all of the different styles you want. If you want compute machines or login servers or management machines or whatever, you can build them all from the same kickstart uh, image, and then bconfig will, will run on top of that to turn everything into the individual types of machines that you want. Is it Sorry. Linux only? Uh, no, it's not. It's actually uh, used on Solaris and OS X to some extent. We have some interest in Windows port, but we haven't actually uh, put any time into that. There are some folks around the lab that are actually really interested in that, but we don't have any usable software at this point on Windows. And generally, it's POSIX. So if you support POSIX, then bconfig can do useful things for you. Okay, so does bconfig redo everything or does it just rely on the underlying packet managers and stuff like that like does it just support rpm and the you know the osx packages and things like that or is it something more like like i don't know i don't know if you ever heard of a tool called radmind which literally tracks by the file and it checks some on that file and you lose track of all the rpm data right so it doesn't work like radmind does um okay so it actually has integration logic to talk to different package management systems and service management systems and things of that sort. Uh, and then there's a driver to talk to POSIX backends, right? So, for example, uh, we have package management drivers for uh, apt, for RPM, for uh, OSX packages that are... The OSX package driver, I'm not sure if it ever got integrated um, because the functionality there, it, it doesn't give you everything that you'd want. But we have fully functional drivers for uh, Solaris System 5 packages, IPS, um, Gentoo uh, package management, and all the service management systems on those platforms are uh, well-supported as well. Huh, okay, so you rely on the natural. So can you do, like, hierarchical kind of configurations? Like, say I have a, two different classes of login nodes, say, like, a GPU login node. Can I kind of...